Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Next Gen Planners podcast. My name is Dan, and I'm the head of community experience here at Next Gen Planners. And today, I am very, very happy to be joined by the wonderful Mr. Paul Taylor. How are you doing today, Paul? Pretty good, thank you. The kids are back in school, so I'm going to have to answer that by saying never better. <laughs> Yeah, as we're recording this, it's just coming towards the end of silly season. And I was always thought it was a bit of a cliche, and I always thought it was a bit of a kind of myth that silly season existed. It absolutely does exist. Finance has been so quiet over the past month. It has been literally like everyone has either been on holiday or distracted by kids or something like that so it's nice to have everyone back again <laughs> it's nice it... you know i was saying to somebody the other day um well i think when i, when I started work on tuesday it felt like january the third yeah. you know when you come back on january the third and you go all right here we go come on game on yeah. let's get at it that, that's what tuesday felt like so uh that's fine by me yeah absolutely so for anyone who doesn't know uh paul he's a financial planner at true potential and he's been working in financial planning for uh, well, I think it's 18 years, Paul, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think that's what we talked last time. Um, you know what? It's, a, it's actually 21 years on 21 the 1st of October this time. I've been a fan, practicing financial planner for 18 years, but I spent my first three years as a life office consultant. It was a graduate role, and it was a lot of fun. I went around seeing hundreds of financial advisors all over the north of England, uh, and it was it was funny. Me. So I can't, the, the saying that life passes quickly, I can't, Anybody much younger than me, I can't stress how true that is. 21 years is, is mind-blowing. Yeah, we, we might touch on that today at some point. But I, don't, <laughs> I don't want this to become too depressing. Um, so we ask everyone this question to start things off, but can you tell us a little bit about what you get up to on a daily basis? What does a day in the life of Paul look like? Well, I'm going to have to give this uh, recording to my wife because uh, I've been, we've been together 15 years and if, if she basically, uh, if you asked her what do I do on a daily basis, she wouldn't have a clue. So uh, I guess this is for you, Jenny. So I guess what I do on a daily basis is to try and follow um, um, a number of what I consider ideal habits to ensure I'm happy, I'm well, and I'm best placed to perform as well as I can do in whatever roles I perform as a human being. And I guess the role that we're interested in today is, is a financial planner. So uh, I read a book many years ago. I'm sure many, many of your listeners will have read it, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the one thing that from Stephen Covey, the one thing that stuck out there was he said, every action you do, you can put it into four quadrants. And the second quadrant was the key one. And that was where effective people, he felt, spent their time and that was in the important non-urgent box. So I try and make sure that I spend most of my day doing tasks that I consider worthy enough to be in that important and non-urgent box. And those tasks I would consider my happiness, my wellness. I spend the bulk of my working day engaging with existing clients and making sure they're following my ideal financial life planning principles. We spend a good chunk of the day looking for new potential clients or prospects to, to you know, maybe, you know, create a bigger footprint and affect society a bit more in that regard also. And as with all people in, in the 40s and beyond, it seems to catch up with us. All my friends seem to have the same ethos at the moment, which we never had in our 30s was, you know, can we help people a little bit? So we're trying to spend a little time in that box as well, typically with young financial planners and typically working on things that I think can make a difference going forward. Huh? I always think human beings operate better, perform better, if for the majority of the time they're following a pattern. And we, whether we know it or not, we are hardwired with a certain pattern. It's called circadian rhythms. And a circadian rhythm is a 90-minute cycle. So, for example, a sleep cycle um, is 90 minutes. You go through all the phases of sleep in 90 minutes. So you sleep four cycles, that's six hours, five, seven point five. So where the optimum eight hour sleep cycle sleep cycles come from, I'll never know. <laughs> so we the, the difference that we make in society is dictated by what we do during the day. And the ideal pattern I like to follow is that that I'm operating in nine, 90 minute cycles. Uh, that I feel helps my wellness, my happiness, and my performance in whatever roles I'm operating in. So 6.30 get up for me and 6.30 to 8 is is getting me on the start line for an 8 o'clock start to work in the best possible condition. 
and it's uh, I might sound a bit wacky here. It's usually a stretch for an aging body. There's a bit of there's a bit of deep breathing in there. There's there's visualizing, you know, the person I want to be that day. There's visualizing how I want that day to go. There's making sure I put some decent stuff in my body to start the day. And uh, I like to uh, get on the start line after a really cold shower. So if any of you listeners have listened to Wim Hof or read his book, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. That gets me on the start line for eight. And the most productive period of the day is usually that first 90 minute cycle, eight to 9.30, we're fresh, we get a lot done. And if you work in a focused way for 90 minutes, let me tell you, you're knackered by the end of it. And you do need a bit of rest and renewal. I don't care what age you are. So 9.30 to 10 is a bit of a breather. And at 10 a.m., I really like to fill my day with an engagement with a a prospect, a client, whatever that might be. I really do like a 10 a.m. meeting. It's the most important slot of the day. So that that engagement potential, some of the follow-up would take me to, you know, through 10, 11.30, another 90-minute cycle. And um, my old accountant died at the same age I'm at now, and he had three kids like me. And he, on our last conversation, he said, I wish I'd taken lunch. And a bit like him, I, I took lunch on the fly in my younger years. So, you know, 11.30 to 12.30, ideal is a bit of rest, a bit of lunch. And then I'm, I'm aiming to get two really focused 90-minute sessions in, in the afternoon. Again, an ideal day, 12.30 to 2, rest from 2 to 2.30, and then hit 2.30 to 4. All of those four cycles really aimed at being in the quadrant two, the important non-urgent box that I really feel drives performance in, in terms of whatever I'm focusing on. And listen, I, I, might, I might be a weakling, I might not, I might like stamina, I don't know, but come four o'clock if I follow that pattern and I've really put a shift in, in those 90 minute cycles, you know, I'm knackered, I'm beat, I need a rest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, we can't operate like that every day because life throws curveballs at us, you know. But if I can choose what I do on a daily basis, it's it's in and around those things. Great stuff. Uh, I love the idea of ninety minute cycles. I think that would work really well. I think, um, especially for people who've got attention disorders and perhaps you know suffer with a bit of procrastination sometimes, the idea of being able to see a finish line and th- which is in sight, which is just 90 minutes away, huge. And knowing that you're going to be able to kind of rest and recover at the end of that. And also the day seems a bit shorter when you when you put it into four segments. I don't know how. It's literally, it's ridiculous how the brain works, but that seems to me like it shortens the day a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I, spent, a lot, I spent a lot of my career thinking um, that, you know what, you're supposed to work hard and rest and working hard doesn't go well together. And I, I was just getting to a point mid-afternoon where I was absolutely spent and I was no good to anybody. And um, for me, yeah, that, that's the optimum way I like to work if possible. Yeah, I mean, I've just realised as well that it's quarter past two when we're recording this. So we are cutting into your rest and recuperation after the third segment. Terrible. Um, I didn't... And so, so if it's a complete flop, that's why it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll take the blame. I have no worries about that. So um, you mentioned there about the project, like you, the stuff you're doing to help uh, younger financial planners. And the, the moment you're working on a project uh, to tell stories of the things that you've learned throughout that career in finance. So over those 21 years of yeah. finance and also 18 years of financial planning as well. Do you know so, the last? <laughs> yeah, go on, Dan. I was just going to say, like, what are the those biggest lessons? Like, if you could summarize the things that you've really uh, picked up and and, and stuff like that, what would they what would they be? I think um, all big lessons come from big mistakes, unfortunately. Mm. So I don't want to spend the whole of this podcast going through all my biggest mistakes, but I might allude, I might allude to one or two. Um, but before I get on to mistakes made and lessons learned, um, I think there's a reality in this industry, and I'm not trying to shift blame here, but there's a reality in the the profession that basically um, has contributed to um, me having to learn some hard lessons. And it's the fact that I think it's very, very, very difficult to, to to get good coaching. So I always found, you know, I started as an advisor at the end of all four, start of all five, and I've really struggled through that whole period to really say, you know, where do I turn to, to to learn how to do this job? And I felt I was self-taught. So, you know, I sent my eldest lad off to high school today for his first day at secondary school. 
And one of my frustrations in life is that schools don't really teach, or, you know, they haven't got the resources to teach young people how to deal with life, you know, the mental approach to life. And I, I found financial services is a bit like that. It, it doesn't really give us the resources to teach us how to do the, you know, the important bits of the job. And I found I had to spend a lot of my formative years trying and erroring, you know, doing some good things well, making some mistakes and really, you know, having to learn the hard way to get to a position where I felt I was really effective. And we know we have people in our industry that, you know, are quite useful to listen to gurus, whatever names you want to give to them. But the reality is most of those people have not done the job for many years and if, uh, if, if they've ever done it at all. And their business models are really geared to, well, I need a lot of people to listen to me to basically make a profit. And the harsh reality is most people, I would say, everybody's an individual. We all have our own habits. And I feel to be effective going forward, we, we need to be coached as individuals. And there's scant resource out there for younger advisors to, to get that help. Because the reality is, the best coaches don't even know they're the best coaches. Because for me, the best coaches are the advisors out there that are doing the job at a high level, that have been doing it for many years. We don't hear from them. You know, you don't see them on social media or projecting themselves on LinkedIn because they're too busy coaching the clients. And I think when we're talking about the project, I'm working on something which will sort of become a bit of a reality next year. And my issue in the industry is we want our experienced advisors to not spend 100% of their time coaching their clients, but we want them to give up some of their time to coach younger advisors on a one-on-one -on -one basis, to really drill down on what they do on a daily basis from a habit perspective, looking at it from the fact that they are present doing the job at the high level at this juncture. And I, I think that's missing. I, I, I've really struggled to you know, really find what is the right way of working from an early stage in my career, because that can save you time and a lot of pain. So I'll give you one example. If we're talking about mistakes made and lessons learned from a lack of coaching is I started in October or one in the industry, just after September the 11th. And we had the three, the only time in history where we had three negative um, returns in global equities three years running. And I bookended that first decade of my career with a credit crunch. So we've gone from the start of that decade to the end of the decade. I might be wrong, but it could have even have been a negative return period for US stocks, one of its worst performing decades of all time. And that's all I ever knew. And for me, the lesson learned was that, that global equities, getting our clients highly exposed to global equities over a sustained period is so fundamentally important in the job. But by 2010, I fell out with global equities. And it's only, it's only after understanding the trajectory of where the world's come from and where it's heading, the mega trends that we're in, and the stock market is the, the global stock market is the weighing machine for the progress that humanity is making. And we are making tremendous progress behind the scenes. And so I think if I could say, what's my biggest mistake? It's not understanding where the world has been and where it's heading the impact the lab that's had on global equities and will do going forward, and maybe the extra turns, returns my clients could have made if I'd have been a bit more steadfast in having them exposed to global equities more. Now, returns isn't about financial planning and life planning. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to pick up on one mistake that I've made that if I felt I was coached better. So I rely, I've relied heavily on the last few years in, in, in that particular area on Nick Murray, who's, uh, you know, he's probably 18 now, Nick, an American-based, you know, coach for financial advisors. And I wish I was reading Nick Murray between 2000 and 2010. I think that would have made, helped me avoid one or two mistakes. But there's, there's many mistakes because I think there's a, a lack of resource for young advisors to go to. I'd like more experienced financial advisors to publish their habits. I'd like more experienced financial advisors to take a bit of their time out of the day and coach at least one financial advisor. And I, I think that I think that'd be a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean I could tell you it's happening. Um it's safe and that's why I've joined your, <laughs> joined, joined your company. Brilliant. So we we do some analytics on how many people send I mean, we don't know what the con content of these messages is, but 
we know that people send like three and a half thousand messages between each other on the platform That's alone. Right. And all of that is coaching. All of that is mentorship. All of that is these exact things that from the practicing financial planners who have actually stuff that they've learned and, and know what they're talking about, who are telling other the younger financial planners how, I mean, the amount of mentorship that goes on in next gen is just ridiculous. It's incredible. Uh, I wish we had you in 05. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, not so much on the global equity side, but certainly the stuff about like, you know, um, how to hold a client meeting, for instance. Oh. Like it's something that you just do not get taught in yeah. the exams. You don't get taught, you don't ever get to get taught. You pick it up and you learn it from mentors. You learn it from people watching people do it and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, you know, that that kind of although it might seem a bit kind of like it's um it might seem a bit unstructured and a bit kind of unformatted, but that is some of the best stuff we've seen is where you know people just 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 do mentorship on an informal basis and they say this is how i run client meetings and this is what works for me that that that, that i wish i had had um, hugely I, powerful yeah massively powerful yeah and if we could like think back to over the last 18 years i, I feel like we're, we're really focusing on how long you've been in well, I know, yeah, that's fine. Whatever, 20 years however long it is right let's just say you've been in financial planning for for long enough to since have at least the, since the turn of the century exactly to seeing some transitions happen so you know even the way you talk about it there is is a, is vastly different to the way it is today i agree financial I agree. advice financial planning it back then even was, was a bit kind of like people thought it was a bit of a hippie term for something that people do with their clients. Whereas now it's like the accepted thing. Like it, 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 it is. And that's wonderful to see how much have you seen, but other than that, how much have you seen our professional industry or whatever we want to call it? How much have you seen it change and develop over the time that you've been in, in it? Yeah. Good, good question. I think, I mean, obviously if I go back to all one and all four, which was my entry point in the industry, which was useful because obviously I met hundreds of financial advisors over that period. Um, I think the first thing I want to say, even in those days, I did meet some exceptional advisors that, that I would still rate as some of the best advisors I've ever, I've ever encountered. Mm -hmm. And again, frustratingly enough, you never you never hear of these people, you know, you never see any work published for them, and I, and I know how good they were. But the harsh reality was in, in that period, you know, nine out of ten financial advisors, shall we say, weren't very good. Mm -hmm. And it was the end of an era you know, the 80s and 90s, it was the unraveling a lot of the tight sales forces, the Pearl, the NPI, Prue, whatever, whatever. And I met a lot of those advisors. And what prompted me to become a financial advisor was going, look, if this is the typical standard, and, you know, you got to remember in those days, I was next gen. You know, I, I felt that, you know, you know, I could do better. Um, and, and that really was why I crossed the divide. And, you know, I can think of some funny, funny cases, but ultimately it was the majority of them revolved around which insurance company was going to pay them the most money to place this business with them. And that is the harsh reality. And again, I would hasten to add some of the best advisors I've ever met were in that period. But the bulk of the bulk of the bulk of it operated like that. And, and when I became a financial advisor in 05, um, and I've had sort of pigeonhole 05 to 2018, I was very much head down blinkered, you know, trial and error. And my engagement with our profession was was probably not as much as it was in those first three years and certainly not as much in the last four years because I, I, I worked in a very disciplined manner with my head down, uh, really focusing in on clients and trying to be the best advisor I could be for them. And it was only in about 2018 where, you know, I, I sort of realised my, my ladder was slightly leaning against the wrong wall, that I, that I sort of picked it up and moved it on another wall when I started paying more attention to the industry because I needed to do that. You know, if I was going to change the way I operated, I needed to understand where I felt the industry was, where it was heading, that kind of thing. But we, what we saw in that old 5 to 18 period was the breaking down of the insurance company monopoly on the industry and, and, and being driven by how much commission they were paying, the emergence of platforms, which really was the death knell for the insurance industry. And the, the emergence, as you said, of financial planning and life planning becoming the absolute not. You know, that, it, it just, that, that is financial planning. So I, I started using cash flow software in 07. So I was very much a student of Paul Armisen and Paul Etheridge, two very different people, but, you know, both massive proponents 
um, of the emergence of financial online planning in, in this country, I would say. And yeah, so we, you know, we've seen a bigger adoption of that, the disappearance of the insurance companies. And I think what we've seen in the last four years is more of the old guard disappear. And COVID has really increased the digitalization, the way we communicate with people significantly. And yeah, I generally feel what happens in the next 10 years, which I think we're going to come on to perhaps, is, is going to be a far quicker period of change than what we've seen in the last 20, but it's certainly been significant based on the advisors I accounted at the start of the century compared to what I see now. Yeah, I mean, the cash flow planning, for instance, is is, is something that you, you, you mentioned in that, what you were talking about there. I almost now, because I, I entered the profession in 2017, sorry, so five years now. So cash flow planning was kind of already popular then. And we used it in our financial planning firm. As a result, I can't really imagine what it's like to have a a client meeting without cash flow now, like in terms of like, I, I don't even know where I'd start. Like yeah. I, don't even, I don't know where I'd start and I don't know where I would end up. It's, it's, it's as fundamental as water and sun is to golf courses. Yeah. You know, golf courses can't exist without them. So I, 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 absolutely. And uh, yeah, thankfully it's, it's, it's just standard practice now. Which is yeah. Cool. It is, and it's. Um, we've got some great tools for it in the UK as well. I think we don't give, we don't pat ourselves on the back of how good the UK is in terms of the choice of cash flow tools that we've got. Um, certainly in other countries like the US, like Australia, like South Africa, and stuff. For instance, they, they, they're very actually. I was speaking to someone from Australia yesterday, and they're actually quite jealous of the choice of good cash flow software that we've got across here in the UK. Um, so we are doing very well on that and we've got that right which is good um Fantastic. maybe that has something to do with our culture or something i don't know maybe it's just because we're like pretty colors i don't know but <laughs> it, it definitely is good um and that even that is something that i would put under the kind of the umbrella of what we used to call soft skills yeah um i just call them skills yeah. Like just communication skills that you need in everyday life yeah. um but it's something that we don't get taught in exams like we mentioned before you don't get taught how to run a client meeting you don't get taught how to use cash flow software you don't get taught how to negotiate with with clients so if there's anyone listening in the audience now who is perhaps a young financial planner or they are just a fan the, the financial planner who are just looking to improve their client meeting skills what advice would you give them on building those skills and, and working on them over the years like you've done? Yeah, I mean, we'll come on to what, what I think are fundamentals, I guess. I think the simple answer to that is they need a good coach. Mm. They, need a, they need a good one-on-one -on -one coach. And uh, I, we'll come back to that because when it, when it comes down to it, financial planning, you know, there's a lot goes on in the industry. There's a lot of people to listen to. We've got the regulator that we need to adhere to. But in the end, the nuts and bolts of it are a human to human engagement. Okay. Uh, that, you know, by whatever medium, whether it's over the phone, um, you know, like this, um, you know, screen to screen or face to face. And the, the reality is we've got to do a lot of things to get to the start line before we can engage with another human in our role. You know, we, we, we've got to pass exams. So we need to demonstrate certain skills, certain technical knowledge, a certain level of competence. You know, we've got to pa pass a fit and proper test with a regulator. And we get on that start line, hopefully, with a desire, um, you know, um, a real, you know, a real willingness to do well. And that's a lot just to get on the start line. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves having to engage with another human being, which is the fundamental nuts and bolts of the job. But because there's so much required to get on the start line, a lot of the focus in the industry is on those other things that get us on the start line, skills, knowledge, competence. But you can only be really effective as a financial planner if you communicate in a way that gets the end user, the client, to take action that, that, that's in their best interest. So it's only in that human to human engagement where you've got to communicate in a really powerful way or enjoyable way, whatever word you want to give to it, it gets that end user to take action in their best interests. So the better you are at communicating with an individual, the art of conversation, call it what you want, um, the more effective you're going to be as a financial planner, the more people you're going to get to take action in the best interests and then the bigger the effect you have, you have on society. 
Um, the reality is, though, I go back to you know the, the guru's business model, who's got to have hundreds of people paying them, and you know that then tends to mean what they deliver is bigger picture. But every conversation is is subtly different. You know, never nobody's ever had the, convers the same conversation twice. And what I what I would like to see, if I was you know as a as a as a, as a coach, is when a golf before a golfer goes on the first tee, he has practice swings, he has drills. You know, it, before you perform an action, a boxer, for example, is going to spar to try and replicate what he's going to do. What do financial advisors do to try and replicate and practice for that human to human engagement? to make that engagement better, to get the client to take action in their best interests and to basically have a bigger footprint on society. We don't practice. Yeah. And there's only one, there's only there's only two ways to practice. You do a role play, but you, and you do it with your coach. And your coach is somebody for me, ideally, who is a practicing financial advisor at that juncture at a good level, who therefore has been in thousands of client meetings and therefore can just pretend to play one of the meetings he's been involved in and who can critique what you're doing at the sharp end. And the great thing about a role play, it can be recorded, it can be dissected, and you can come to understand how you could have made that engagement better for the recipient in a way that got them to take action in their best interest. And the other one is obviously, you know, when we do many of these meetings now, which wasn't the case a couple of years ago, um, you know, many of these meetings can be recorded. It's good practice to record them from a regulatory perspective, and it's good practice to record them from a coaching perspective. So, you know, having a meeting with a client, having it recorded, and then going through that meeting with a, a coach who I would prefer to be a practicing high-level financial planner, where you dissect minute by minute, you know, how that meeting went, I think that's a big, big deal. And as I say, practicing for that human-to-human -human engagement, nobody does it. And I think that is where, I think that is where, coaching on that minutiae level um, needs to be more commonplace. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, it's a fab idea. I think, uh, again, there's there's a, there's a lot that goes on. I know there is. Um, and I know there's a lot of role play going on. And I think, uh, what would you repeat here what I've said in another podcast recently as well, which is that, you know, you're not, with, no one thinks that they're going to get this stuff right overnight. Like this stuff takes years of maybe not years, it's different for everyone. Um, but it does take time to get right. Uh, and and I think I think as well of it, a lot of it comes to, down to your own confidence. So for instance, if I just take my personal thing, I did a speaker and influencer program at Next Gen um in 2021. And just by learning how that kind of stuff, like so we we basically we had to speak in front of a global audience at the end of it. And once you've done that, those one-to-one -one meetings or stuff like that, they're nothing anymore. So having that confidence to be able to say, I'm confident about what I know and how to portray it and, and doing a program or something where you can learn that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff is also really, really powerful as well. I completely agree. And just to remind you, hopefully you've got me down on the program for 23. On <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I've just seen like even the people who've done that, the, the 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 next level stuff that they've gone on to do is just ridiculous. Yeah. You know, the whole point of it is to become a better influencer. But being a being a financial planner is about influencing people. It's about it's about leaving an influence on your clients. Uh, and and we don't talk about it enough about how how much how important influence actually is, yeah. and learning to become an influencer as well. And there's certain influences that are more important than others, but influencing somebody on how to live their best life, to use their money, um, and, you know, their money in a way that enhances their life. Um, you know, influencing them in that, in that way. I, there's not many more important ways of influencing a human being than that. And that's why it's such an important role in society. It is. Uh, I mean, I get laughed at sometimes by people when I say that it's it's one. It's almost like another emergency service. This this kind of stuff. The level of importance of it. But we, the reputation now there is not good for financial advice. I think everyone would agree with that in the audience. It's getting better, but it's still not good. Um, and that's a shame. It's a real shame because because people don't understand the power of financial planning. I don't think at a large scale in our in our. Um, culture in the uk so we need to work on that as well 
Agreed. We're going down loads of different angles here, man. This is this is we're going down loads of different it's just, it's just like a normal client meeting. You go down around, we talk about <laughs> meetings or whatever. That's you know, good. as long as we get back on piece, it doesn't matter. Exactly. And and I think that's something I want to touch on as well, is the structure of these client meetings. So yeah. you you've sat in I'm assuming like thousands of them over yeah, the years yeah. in terms of not only watching other people do them, but you doing them yourself and yeah. unsuccessful client meetings. I'd imagine they'd be there as well. Um, so, uh, especially nowadays, I think we're, we're quite distracted and where, you know, we've got short attention spans and as a result, if we don't find something immediately engaging or interesting, we switch off like, like that, like our concentration is just ridiculous nowadays. So, what have you picked up over the years? Again, it's kind of similar to the last question, but a bit different of, of making them actually enjoyable for yeah, clients. That's, 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 a, that's, that's a good point. So again, if we, if, we, if we get down to the nuts and bolts, you know, to get somebody to take action that's in their best interest, we have to have a, a human to, 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 to human engagement. And even outside of financial planning, one of the things that I try and do is and this is the number one objective for the meeting it's written down is we want to leave somebody with a feeling of increase so if you go into the petrol station and the person behind the cashier you know you're making payment if you leave that person with a feeling of increase i don't mean a monetary increase a tip but you know making them feel pretty good about themselves and um, in any any human to human engagement in any walk of life if you can leave somebody with a feeling of increase and um, they're going to enjoy that yeah, that is the bottom line. So the number one objective is is to leave somebody with a feeling of increase because they're going to enjoy that. But how would you do that? And I go back to um, crikey, was his you know quote just coming to my yeah it's just coming to my head. I, I can't remember who said it might have been even Dale Carnegie. If you talk to somebody um, about themselves, they will listen for hours. Mm. Right? So if you talk to somebody about themselves, they listen for hours. Well, that means they're enjoying the conversation. And this is why we go down to the subtle art of engaging with another human being. And for me, fundamentally, a, a meeting structure needs to create an environment, a platform, where somebody um, feels free and secure enough to talk about themselves. So we listen for hours. So, you know, if, they if they're talking about themselves and they feel really comfortable, are they going to have enjoyed that meeting? Yeah, you're damn right they have. You don't write that. Um, so, I mean, for example, my meeting structure, an initial meeting where I don't know somebody, is very simple. It's set, just set the scene, of, of which is no big deal. But the first item on the agenda is past. Yeah. So, can we create an environment where that individual can just freewheel and take me up to the present day? You know, walks and all. And I think that's really important. And then, if if, if they've opened up and they're feeling free. And the, the jibber jabber and the tongue is loose. We're probably then in a position to focus on the future. You know, what are the future possibilities for this person? What is their ideal future? And again, if they are talking about themselves, you're probably going to get the answers to the great questions, the profound questions that they all we all want answers to, without even asking those questions. So it's about creating a safe and secure environment. Uh, where somebody feels comfortable enough to talk about themselves. And I go back to it. If they're talking about themselves, they're going to enjoy the engagement. Well, there comes a time as an advisor where you've got to coach somebody. Yeah, You've got to deliver something. You've got to explain something. And it doesn't matter what that is from a cash flow exercise, from a life planning principle, from an investment principle. It could be anything. But what we don't give any attention to as advisors is how can we explain this principle in quite a unique way that is really engaging to the person listening to it. So, for example, I can pick something really basic, you know, the benefits of paying to, into a pension, something really boring on the face of it. How can you explain that boring concept to somebody that is really engaging and creates value and impact and prompts them to take action and goes, oh, that was quite interesting. Well, I've never really thought of it like that. So you've got to create a platform where somebody can talk about themselves so they can listen for hours. They're going to enjoy that. You've got to leave a person with a feeling of increase. Quite often that is through, through coaching, from getting them to a better place. But the onus is that when you're explaining something 
about what you want to do for them and why. We've got to be creative in what we come up with in explaining that simple concept to make it different, to make it enjoyable. So I spent a lot of time over the years trialing and erroring different ways of explaining typical concepts that we have as financial advisors. And I like to think um, we're, we're reasonably quite unique in the way we convey our messages, which quite often will get the end the recipient to say, oh, oh quite different that. Um, you, you can listen as you well know you know if you've got experience of one-to-one -one coaching when you, you can spend hours on this in detail and it's a lifetime of learning as you've said the nuances of creating a safe space for somebody to open up the, the ability to create that safe space is you know it, it, quite often it's you can't cheat that process sometimes you need a lot of time in the ring to learn that ring craft and mm -hmm. some of it's sensory some of it you just pick up on energy in the meeting and sometimes you need you need practice and experience with other humans to do that. So, yeah, we could spend we could spend hours on that one, but hopefully, hopefully, I got that across. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, this is something we've covered recently. Well, I've just I've actually just recorded this other podcast today with with um, someone called Dennis Hahalakis, and he's really given some really good ideas. And it's exactly what we were, we were covering there, which is about creating that safe space so people can talk about themselves for hours because. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, I mentioned this in the last podcast, but they how they they've probably never had that opportunity to talk about themselves for that long. I mean, it's not going to be for hours, but like they've never had that opportunity to talk about themselves for that long. Um, and who 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 doesn't love talking about themselves? <laughs> I guess that's one of the things about financial planners as well is to train yourself to not love to talk about yourself. Um, because the client doesn't care. The client doesn't give a toss about your awards, your qualifications, what you've done, uh, the fact that you've also got a holiday home in Spain or whatever it is. Like they, they, they really don't care. Like I, it's think it's, I think I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's really important that unless asked, you don't project any of yourself onto onto the client, um, yeah. particularly in that early phase. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been a massive believer in that and, and, and perhaps arguably had to learn that the hard way in my earlier years as well from a lack of coaching, but completely concur. Yeah. And this is kind of switching it up a little bit, but you mentioned at the start, you mentioned about habits and that the book that has had a, a massive impact on you. And this is something we chatted about when we were kind of putting this podcast together was this this... I'm going to call it a fascination. I'm fascinated by them um, with micro and macro habits. Yeah, yeah. And this is something else that's covered in Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is a good book as well. Yeah. So you kind of went through it a little bit when you were talking about the kind of 90 minute segments and stuff like yeah, that. But like, yeah. can you tell us how you use them as a financial planner and and, and understand micro and macro habits? And, I think um, I think the best way to explain it is. If you look at a specific you know, micro habits, and I, I don't, I don't need James Clear. I'm looking at his book actually, just as I, yeah. <laughs> and I read it a long time ago, and I don't know if he covers macro or micro habits. No, it, I, I thought I'd come up with that myself, uh, but if he does cover it, then he's obviously just stuck in his subconscious, subconscious mind. Yeah. And so, a micro habit for me is something specific to the role that you're focusing on. So, one of the things I'm key for is. Really good financial advisors to publish their micro habits of how they do their job, yeah, which is something I might do, obviously. And, you know, I think if I had 10 really successful financial advisors publish their micro habits, i.e. what habits do they employ on a day-to-day -day basis in their role as a financial advisor, I'd be really keen to read that. And I'd be really keen to try one or two see what worked for me, and then put a little bit of self on, on that. I think it's always good to take the best bits from people you meet and then put a little of your own personal stardust on there, a bit of self on it. So micro habits, I have certain habits that I do on a day-to-day -day basis in my role as a financial planner. And there'll be other advisors more successful than me who employ totally different habits. Um, they're habits specific to themselves, in their role as a financial advisor, and that's micro habits. But I think macro habits are more universal. They are things I think in any walk of life that fundamentally need to be adhered to, adhered to, to sustain long-term effectiveness. Okay, 
So, you know, I'll give you I'll give you an example. And it just came to me last night. James Milner came on for Liverpool against Newcastle. And I've seen James Milner in real life. He looks a million dollars. This is a man who has looked after himself year in, year out. And he's not the most talented footballer in the world. And he made his Premier League debut or top-level debut at age 16. And 20 years on, he's still playing at the highest level, despite not having the most talent in the world. Because no doubt his day-to-day -day habits have, have given that longevity. Then if you look at a Mario Bar Balotelli from a number of years ago, tremendously talented individual, who um, his micro habits on a day-to-day -day basis got him to a certain level, but not for long. And I think that was because his macro habits weren't good. James Milner's macro habits are good. You know, what he does, um, looking after himself, probably the way he approaches things mentally, um, what he habitually does in those areas are macro habits that are important to us all in whatever walk of life that we're in. So a classic example would be for me, you know, I need, I feel looking after your, you know, working on your internal self, your mental health, and to a certain extent, your physical health, I think is a macro habit that's so fundamental to long-term success as a human being on planet Earth that it, it cannot be cheated. So I think to be successful long-term in your roles as a human being, you've got to combine good micro habits, i.e. specific to whatever role you're focusing on, and good macro universal habits. And I guess the um, the combination of those two should create a result greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. So I guess if you could analogize it, especially sticking with the James Builder example, for instance, and the Balotelli. I love that example, by the way. It's really good. Yeah. The idea of like the, the micro habits would be, for instance, the talent that we have, like micro habits would be being able to kick a football quite well and being yeah. able to do tricks with it and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas the macro habits is the hard work that goes into it behind the scenes. It's the... Yeah. It's yeah. the training. It's the showing up for, for, for practice 10 minutes earlier than everyone else. It's the... Yeah, that's it. I mean, even even bigger than that, I just think if we look at James Milner, I'm no doubt he has um, a mental approach to life and his, and his internal wellness that we probably all should adopt to a certain extent that, that, that's made him successful over a sustained period. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, those are the things that really interest me. And, I, I, and the reason I, the reason they interest me is because for a long period of time, I thought my micro habits in my day jobs of financial advising were very good. And I don't think my macro habits were that good. So I got to a point of probably exhaustion about three or four years ago, simply because my macro habits weren't where they should be. So the 2022 me, as opposed to the 2018 me, has better macro habits, which makes me a happier person, which is likely to make me a better performer in the roles that I've got to perform in life, financial yeah. advising, husband, whatever, whatever. It's good stuff. It is because, like, I mean, it comes to the attitude of people as well. For instance, like, we, we, we how many people do we know that are just do, do people in the audience? Do you know about who are really, really, really talented people, but they haven't got the right attitude to 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 make that into something really powerful? You know, they've they might be the cleverest people ever, but they haven't got that work ethic and they haven't got the the macro habits that you mentioned in there to be able to 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 put that into practice. And Wasting talent, the most frustrating thing on planet Earth. Exactly. <laughs> Getting quite philosophical here, aren't we? <laughs> um, we've been talking for like 43 minutes now and time's really? absolutely flying by. So, yeah, I think we should... Um... Well, talk to somebody about themselves and they'll listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing that in practice today, aren't we? So... You mentioned earlier as well about the your what you want to see in the next ten years. Uh, we ask everyone this question because I think it's it's a it's a lovely question to ask because it's quite optimistic and and people are optimistic about it, which is amazing. So let's just think. Let's just think of this period over the next ten years. Mm -hmm. What are you most excited to see in the world of financial planning during that time? What are you most excited for it to happen over that that decade? Yeah, that's a good point. I think I'll start with what I don't think will change. And that is, um, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a decent human being, you go into an engagement with a prospect or a client, you want to leave them with a feeling of increase. You know, that is a principle. You want to help that person live their best life with the financial resources they've got available to them. That is a principle. There are principles that we employ in our role as a financial planner that should never change. Um, the way we communicate them might change, but those principles 
you know, shouldn't change. But there are things that that will change, and I'm looking forward to changing. So I think I've seen a number of stats about how many advisors won't be advising in the next five years or by the end of the decade. And let's just let's throw the one out there that 75% of advisors won't be advising in five years. And that really will mean the old guard will have gone and it will be the next generation um, that, that will be, you know, the occupants, the financial planners. And when we talk about reputation in the industry, um, all you can do as a financial advisor is do your bit with the consumers that you engage with to leave a good impression with your industry. And I think if we're talking about, you know, a few years down the line, it's all post RDR and it's all people doing things that used to be niche but are now standard. And um, I, I think that will automatically, you know, drive that that change of perception about the profession that you that, that, that you talked about. Um, there's going to be new technology uh, that's coming at pace. I know it is, and um, I'm not a great tech guy. I always try hard to be an early adopter. Um, only not not through technical brilliance, but just because I recognise that you, I think you need to be. So I, I think it's 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 still using the same principles, but how you use technology to enhance your client experience uh, to create added value for for, for your client to have a bigger impact on on, on society. But the bit that I, the the bit that I really want to see cracked is the business model. I'm guilty of this. So I have the same business model that most people have, which I think is fundamentally flawed. I don't need to go into what that business model is. You probably know what it is. Hmm. And as, as, as financial planners, we um, the utopia we have is that our clients die at zero. Yeah? They have spent every pound that they have created in life and turned it into experience or fulfillment through doing or giving. Yeah, you know, you know that's what cash flow planning is all about, isn't it? Is understanding, I guess, if you've got more than you need, how much extra you can spend. So the principle of dying with zero, your check bouncing to the undertaker, whatever word you want to give to, mm-hmm. is is really what life and financial planning is all about. So that is diametrically opposed to the standard business model we see in the industry. If you think about it, it's just diametrically opposed. I don't have the answers, and um, without trying to pass the book. Um, I'm not the old guard, I'm not the young guard, I'm somewhere in the middle. And I think it's the next generation, as you say, that need to come up with that new business model that allows financial advisors to make a profit, but ultimately isn't diametrically opposed to allowing your clients to die with zero. The other thing that I'm keen on is as financial planners, in effect, we're coaches. Now, in most walks of life, coaches see their students graduate you know they've taught them how to fish they're not there to hold the rod for them every second or every hour till the day that we die and our business models are geared to um holding the rod for people till the day that they die and i think real good coaching is about teaching somebody how to fish or letting them graduate whatever that is and i would love to see and, and this is where, you know, particularly for younger people that I would speak to, I, I don't want them to rely on a financial advisor for the rest of the world. If I'm a decent coach, I should be able at some point to set this person off on their way to be self-sufficient, to fish, to graduate. That's not good for our business model, is it? So I would like to see um, financial advisors somewhere create a new business model in the future that allows them to make a profit but well, sees people graduate, sees people become self-sufficient instead of being reliant on them for the rest of their life. Mm. I've never heard that before. Well, I have, but in the personal training world, um, one of the PTs I follow on Instagram said, like, if, if you still got a personal trainer six months after you hired them, you either really like them as a person or they haven't done their job properly. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's kind of true, isn't it? It's like, you know, if, if you still need a PT other than to hold you accountable, if you haven't seen the results after after six months or whatever, then why are they it, still there? It needs, it, need, it needs a brand new business model. And that is the one thing, if I was looking 10 years down the line, yeah, that, that, that's the one thing I'd want to see. Awesome. 
we never had that one before, so that's that's good. I think we've had we've had things about changing kind of fee structures and things. We, I, I, I don't. I mean, fees fees bore the hell out of me to be honest. Like I can't. We never talk about fee structures on here, but I think it's good that you kind of left it out as well. <laughs> like I, the business model is 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 verging on that, but it's good to talk about it a little bit. So. Uh, we always like to ask our guests for a book as well that has helped them uh, in their career. You, you looked right when you said that you were looking at James Clear's Atomic Habits, which makes me think that your bookcase is on the right no. and that you've got like hundreds of books on no, there. Well. No, I left them. Um, and I made, you know, I made a work change about four years, a few years ago, and I left all my books there because they're paper, you know. Um, so there's, there's a couple kicking around that are really important to my life. So it's interesting you should ask that. The first thing I want to say about books is that most people will read a book, then they'll read another book, then they'll read another book. Unless you've got a photographic memory, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. And knowledge isn't power. It's, it's only potential power. Action is where the power is. And so one of the things I learned from books is that if you really get a good book, you need to make notes on them and you need to act on those notes. That is the bottom line, instead of just reading and reading for the sake of it. And I listened to your podcast with Bob Verres a few weeks ago. And you asked him this question and he started talking. And I don't know where within me, I just knew he was going to say the same two books as me. You know this because yeah, I emailed I you straight after the bloody podcast. Yeah, yeah. And so I like Bob say the, the, the books that have the biggest impact on me are the books that help me manage the self you know, the internal me. And my two best books by a country mile that I have read in the last 20 years of reading are the same as his. And that is The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, which is there, and An Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And um, he's just got a new book out, actually, Michael Singer, which is Living Untethered. So yeah, I think yeah. The Untethered Soul was, you know, it's probably 15 years old, maybe. Read it a long time ago. Living Untethered as well is a good book. Don't get me wrong, but those are the two outstanding books I've ever read. They are books that I have extensive notes on that I review all the time to check that I'm living by those principles. Very sad indeed. I even have a couple of recordings with some of so if I'm in <laughs> Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sad. But, oh, by a country mile, those two are the outstanding books. And I've, uh, I suppose I've read a few. So I want to highly, highly recommend. Completely agree with that, mate. Um, I, I, I've, wax lyrical about one of the only books because i'm not a great reader one of the only books i've ever read right for the way through is one that's sitting on the bookshelf behind me and it's called building a story brand by a guy called donald miller and that changed things so much for me right. that i actually we've i use it in my framework with all of my clients for website stuff and all sorts of things i've actually made a, a checklist i've made a google form out of it i've, I've completely used every single thing in there so now it is central to everything that i do and i completely like if you could do those things with other books like if you could yeah. build you know some kind of framework or something because these books aren't designed to just like you said just stay in your head they're designed to force you to do something you've got to and take I, action yeah absolutely and and i completely agree with what you were saying there they're like actually put them into practice you know use what they're saying and and do something with it you could read all the books in the world but unless you do something about it they're useless they're pointless yeah so uh yeah great thanks for that recommendation <laughs> no honestly <laughs> it's, it's like it's like 180 pages like it's not one of the longest books in the world which is what is good for me as well with my short attention span and uh, i think i got it through it in three days and awesome. completely changed things like it will change the way you think about marketing forever it's it's just it will so I'll look, I'll look forward to that that's next on the list good stuff well i think we'll probably end it there because we've been yeah this this has been a really really good um good conversation there's so much more we could have talked about but yeah. i think that that's that's a nice way to finish so we always like to give the word uh, the last word to our guests to say a big thank you for coming on so do you want to um tell people where to find you how to connect with you maybe tell us about some upcoming projects that you've got and leave us with any last thoughts as well Wow. Um, I spent um, a lot of my life, um, you know, being in a position where people can't find me. Um, I have no Facebook account. Um, I have no real presence on social media. And it goes back to the managing of the self. And, um, you know, 
distraction. And one of my favorite authors is Joanna Hari, who talks about, um, you know, social media, the problems it's caused in society. But I do recognize um, that if you want to help people, if you want to reach people, you have to have that presence. And I, I don't have it. I've got a LinkedIn profile somewhere. I'm, I think I've got about 250 people on there. I probably don't know them. I probably don't know any of them. And um, I think one of the things that I need to work on going forward um, and step out of my safe house, my comfort zone, is to is to have a bit more of a presence. So the only social, the only element of social media I am on apparently is LinkedIn. And please connect with me there because I think the way the way, where I'm heading is. And it's just in your forties thing, you know. All my friends are in the same boat. We, I don't know what happens when you turn forty, but you just feel an urgent need to help more people. And if people do connect with me on LinkedIn, um, I've probably got some good stuff coming. And uh, that, 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 that's all I'll say on the matter. Uh, but some of the things I've been working on in twenty two that will manifest in twenty three. But at the end of the day, there's no audience. It's pointless. <laughs> so I need to step out. My safe house and build that build that presence because yeah I've hidden away for so long just just to keep a simple life but if you want to help people you want to make a difference you can't you can't do that simple so yeah that's uh, quite quite opposite to probably a lot of the people you deal with the last point I wanted to say was I was totally blown away by listening to your um, the young American you had on recently and how he used social media to engage with people and things like that and fundamentally that's not next generation. And um, I definitely that definitely made me feel old and inspired me to try and build more social media presence going forward. So that's what's next. There is stuff coming next year. And if I get a few connections on LinkedIn, then I might start putting some stuff on. Good stuff. Fantastic. Well, um, I must say a big thank you to you, Paul, for coming on today. It's been really, really lovely to chat with you. Um, so that was uh, Mr. Paul Taylor from True Potential. Uh, and if you enjoy this podcast, you can share it with your friends and colleagues and, well, family members, if you like. Um, and you'll be able, they'll be able to find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and our website, which is nextgenplanners.co.uk. Uh, on there, you'll find more information about all the things we do here at NextGen, including the community, of which Paul is a member, our conference, which is coming up next year, which is going to be absolutely enormous. Uh, we've got all sorts of different products to help you guys uh, be better financial planners. And there's loads more stuff on there as well. We are on all the social media channels, um, so just as Paul's been talking about, so you can find us on there. And we are on TikTok now, and we're looking to grow our audience on there, so please do follow us on there. And the final thing is to just, if you enjoyed this podcast, please just do leave us a review. You have no idea how much that kind of stuff helps us grow the podcast and develop it over the next few years. But again, thank you so much to Paul for joining us on today's show. Thank you guys at home for listening, as always, and we will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.